Hello everyone, I'm Challenger Jakku and welcome back to the No Ring Challenge series, where we take on Sonic Heroes to see if it's possible to beat the game without collecting any rings. But before we begin, if you love Sonic content or challenge videos in general, and you want to see more content like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash the subscribe button, like the video and hit that naughty bell. We're now on the road to 2k subscribers by the end of the year, and any help to hit that goal is truly appreciated. Now I'll quickly go over the rules of the challenge, just as a bit of a refresher since it's been a while. First of all, if we collect a ring at any point, it counts as a fail and we have to restart the stage. Next, the run will begin at Seaside Hill and is completed upon the defeat of the Egg Emperor. And finally, yes, this run will be glitchless as they weren't really needed during the routing. Now, without any further ado, let's jump straight in. A quick sign up before we start. In this first part, we'll be covering three of the four stories, Team Sonic, Dark and Rose respectively. To keep this simple though, I will only be referencing my run with Team Sonic for the most part when something applies to all three of the runs. The only time I'll be mentioning Team Dark and Rose specifically is when we reach a portion of the stage or an obstacle that is unique to their own stories. So if I don't mention them, what applies to Team Sonic's run will also apply to them as well. Right off the bat, I'm going to get this out of the way. Seaside Hill is sadly not possible with either Team Rose or Team Dark, both for very similar reasons. In the case of Team Rose, since their stages are far shorter in length, you start around the midpoint of the stage. And sadly, since you aren't given full control right away, we're forced into two rings before we can even home an attack away. I have no clue why they thought it was a good idea to take away control from the player, but it is why it is, sadly. The next one utterly confuses me though. Team Dark's spawning point is the same as the other stories aside from Team Rose. However, the game wants to control until you hit a launch pad further down the linear track. By that point though, you would have already collected four rings. After some trial and error, I was able to somewhat gain control of Shadow prematurely by using the light speed dash, but we're still forced to collect two rings for our trouble. Considering Team Dark is the story for advanced players, I find it bewildering how they automated the first section forcing you to collect the rings here, whilst that isn't the case with Team Sonic. These inconsistencies are constantly rearing their ugly heads throughout the entire game, and so I will mention them as they pop up. Sadly though, we're forced to continue on with a total of four rings. For Team Sonic, whilst the first section is automated as well, we are thankfully able to gain control just before we run headfirst into the rings, switching to the flight formation due to how the AI is programmed in this game. You see, whenever you use the speed formation, your other team members are coded to go and collect nearby rings, and in the context of our run, that's a death sentence. By remaining in flight formation, the characters are stuck together, bypassing this completely, albeit with the caveat of having the mini school top speed. As we hit the first spring, we need to make sure we avoid the rainbow rings at all costs. In Sonic Heroes and only Sonic Heroes, you will actually gain rings depending on the amount of characters that go through them at once. I have no idea why this is even a thing as it only holds true for this one game. It is easily avoidable though as we reach the first checkpoint, once we return to the flight formation due to the gears that will forcibly switch your character for you upon walking through them. Now there is a ring container at the height of this automated loop, however you can fight against the automation and just kind of thread the needle to jump through the loop itself clearing the way forward. Instead of taking out the egg pawns in this next area, all the flight characters have enough altitude to just use the stone blocks as platforms and reach the next section without any hassle. Since Sonic Heroes is a combat heavy game, at least compared to the previous titles, it will be in our best interest to avoid combat at all times, moving our way to the next checkpoint. Oftentimes, the loops in Sonic Heroes will have three paths, one destinated for each character with some containing rings or ring containers. We are able to fight against the automation and the flight formation, but you do have to be careful as the camera will completely shift on you as you try to fly your way through. As we reach the beach section, we have to use the cannons to push on and they're actually really cool. You see the cannons will act differently depending on the formation you enter them as. Controlling the speed character it will simply push you forward to the next path. As the flight character they will shoot you skywards, allowing you to reach secret areas or hidden goodies. And as the power character you're given full control, allowing you to shoot your team members wherever you please. It's a nice bit of diversity, allowing you to choose whatever is best depending on the current situation. For now though we switch back to Sonic so we can push on reaching the final set piece of the stage, involving in these weird makeshift carts. To put it simply, these cars will push you down a linear circuit filled with traps, goodies and rings. And if you complete it in one piece, you'll gain a level up depending on the character you enter the cart with. Since we're constantly moving forward, it can be tricky to avoid the rings here. Although we are able to do so with Team Sonic thanks to the constant jump spam. And this also applies to Team Dark as well. With Team Rose though, it's a different story. For some reason, they put a row of three balloons in the centre of the circuit. Meaning we're forced to hit one of them resulting in a fail. As all three balloons contain rings. The jump doesn't have enough height 
quite to leap over them, unfortunately, so it just isn't possible with Team Rose. As long as we take the upper path with Tails when we reach the open section, the rest of Seaside Hill is pretty much a straight shot to the goal with how linear the stage becomes. There is another cart section that is easily clearable, which forces us to break yet another loop with the flight characters so we can avoid the rings along the path. Unfortunately, the final loop that takes us to the end of the stage does contain a ring trail, forcing us into a precise flight over a boundless pit in which we are thankfully able to barely clear, making it possible to beat Seaside Hill ringless with Team Sonic. However, Team Rose and Dark aren't able to do so. For the most part, Ocean Palace is mostly the same as to what we've already been doing, with hero structures being inspired by the classics. Despite having a different stage name, it's essentially the act 2 of this song per se, and so by using the flight characters to bypass the automation of the loops containing rings, along with the numerous egg pawns and breakable structures from the air, we're easily able to breach the first checkpoint. Upon reaching the fans, we seemingly have no way to reach the higher pathway. This is where the new move known as the triangle die comes into play. Do you remember how Knuckles would glide over large distances in both the classics and the adventure game? Well, it's basically that, just a whole lot worse. For starters, you can only really take advantage of this where there are fans to push you upward. Because the range of the triangle dive is so abysmal, if you try to use this to skip portions of a stage for example, your momentum will abruptly cease and the team falls like rocks. Don't get me wrong, it's a neat concept, but it's just rather useless outside of a few arbitrary set pieces. You do have to be careful as sometimes ring balloons will be put in your path whilst gliding, so it's best to stay on the edge of the fans and carefully inch yourselves out of their path. As we reach the section with the turtle platforms, we are tasked with using the various cannons to bridge our way over to the next section of the stage, whilst defeating the egg pawns to unlock the cages as we progress. Because of the cannons, there are a variety of different ways that we can go here, which is really cool. Team Sonic can just get away with taking the speed route, with Sonic entering the cannon as the leader, as the rings and containers are easily avoidable reaching the next checkpoint. But with Team Dark, if we try to do the same, towards the end, we'll be forced to use the flight rings to reach the final turtle, where an unavoidable ring balloon stands in our way. Thankfully, we are able to bypass this completely by taking the flight route instead, but that had me worried for a little while there. For Team Rose, this is where their version of Ocean Palace ends. For Team Sonic and Team Dark, however, upon another section where we have to make use of the triangle dive and avoid the enemies and classing structures, we reach the iconic boulder chase set piece that will take us to the goal ring. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this section can be extremely jank. Thankfully, there aren't many rings placed throughout most of this section, so if you can clear the loop unscathed, it is possible to reach the end of this stage rather easily. This loop, however, contains a ring trail placed along the straightaway leading to the dash pad, so we have to avoid them all the while being fast enough to evade the boulder. At first I thought we could easily run through this with the speed character, but because of how the AI is programmed, one of your team members will always careen themselves into the ring trail, and if you use the flight formation you're simply too slow to clear the loop without dying from the boulder. I eventually figured out that whilst you're in the power formation, not only are Knuckles and Omega fast enough to clear the loop, the AI won't actively search for the rings. So as long as we gently inch our way to the left to avoid the final ring trail after the dash pad, it's just a clear shot to the goal as long as you avoid the numerous balloons, clearing Ocean Palace with all three teams. Now the Egg Hawk is a pushover no matter the story you're playing. The only thing that we need to be wary of are the rings that the team spawn right in front of, and since the default formation is the speed formation, your team members will collect the ring before you even have a chance to switch. So to circumvent this, we need to hold the analog stick at a downward angle and mash the A button before the battle even starts. This allows us to home an attack away from the rings, giving us the chance to switch to the flight formation. From here, we just have to follow the egg heart to the open section, avoiding the pellets in the process. As soon as it lowers itself to the sand, the egg heart will start to spin counterclockwise, barraging you with its laser pellets. Your approach here will depend on the team you're playing as, but honestly, it still amounts to the same thing by switching to the power character. Both Knuckles and Omega are capable of barraging the egg heart with their punches, and in his boss fight very quickly. However, Big doesn't have a punch, just his umbrella attack that's incredibly slow. So instead, we just have to spam his belly flop, and as long as you're fast enough, you can destroy the air cart before it flees. Regardless, this boss is possible to beat Ringless, no matter what team you're playing as. As we move on to Grand Metropolis, our teams must traverse Eggman's automated energy plant, used to power the many roles of this futuristic city. Now, boss Heroes does borrow heavily in terms of classic inspiration, I do appreciate the level of care and effort that was put into giving these new environments their own identity. Don't get me wrong, you still have similar stage screens that you'd expect from a Sonic game, like the casinos and Green Hill-like opening. However, rather than simply copying and pasting without understanding what made these aesthetics appealing in the first place, they have gone to great detail to make these levels feel original. Not one stage 
Aging Heroes makes you feel like it's a carbon copy of previous games, allowing them to respect the past without actually retreading through it. Anyway, the first section of the stage is rather automated. We don't gain control of the characters until they land on the blue translucent pathway after the dash pad. This is fine as no rings appear here until we land on the road, but we do have to be careful and hold an attack away from the rings giving us enough time to enter the flight formation. The blue roads brimming with energy will actually push our characters into the direction of the current, so we do have to be careful of the extra speed as we reach the turtle mech. These mechs come in two flavours, the standard green shell you see here and the reinforced golden shells that we will eventually see throughout this zone. Both are pretty much dealt with in the same way. Sonic is unable to damage them at his base level, so we either need to use the blue tornado in order to flip it on its back allowing us to home and attack the weak point, or the power characters can literally melt them in seconds. I really like how the enemies in this game have multiple methods of dealing with them depending on your situation. It just adds a surprising layer of depth that you don't really see when it pertains to the combat in previous Sonic games. Defeating this mech opens the gate though, reaching the next checkpoint as we avoid the many enemies and rainbow loots en route to the next energy field path. Whilst there are rings placed along the straightaway, the actual automated section does not, so we're safe to dash through to reach yet another checkpoint. Inside the buildings, we're encouraged to use the light speed dash to cross the various bottoms pits, something we can't do given the circumstances. The flight characters can reach the other side though, it's just that because of how limited the flight is in Heroes, you're gonna want to cross the gap as much as you can with your standard jump before taking off. As we are crammed into the linear hallways from this point on, we take care to only take out the enemies guarding the switches with the power characters, only to take an L after a nearly fire's thunder shoot. You see in Heroes, whenever you hit a spring, the star emblem will light up depending on what side of the bumper you touch, and once all three light up, you're granted a goodie, usually in the form of rings. Because the thunder shoot homes in on the by enemies and bounce pads, Sonic got his ass stuck against it causing all three to light up, forcing us to restart this section all over again. Upon clearing it though, we're met with two poles that we need to vault over to reach the upper section. There are two ways we can do this, both involving the speed character, the most reliable of which is simply by using the tornado attack and this will allow the character to ride to the top before falling off it. However, you can also do this through the homing attack, as your characters will gain the property of the blue tornado once they reach level 3, so it really does depend on your current situation. For the first pole, we don't really they bother with it as Tails can just fly around the barrier no problem. Sadly, this isn't an option for the second pole as the path is simply too high for us to reach without the blue tornado. So what's the problem exactly? Well, right in front of the pole we have a ring container, and since we need to switch to the speed formation there is a very good chance the AI would force themselves into it. To mitigate this, I tried to use the blue tornado from higher up, hoping we would be out of the reach of the container, but because we didn't take care of the enemy beforehand, Sonic instead locked onto it, which scared the hell out of me. Once we took out the mech though, we were able to reach the next section without destroying the ring container, but bloody hell man. Now as long as we avoid the rings along the grind rails, the rest of Grand Metropolis really isn't too different as to what we've encountered thus far. Having to use the blue tornado to scale the inside of this building, where Team Rose's version of the stage ends, clearing out the enemies to unlock more poles, and as soon as we take our time traversing down the final straightaway, availing the crushes of ring containers, Grand Metropolis is completed without collecting any rings for both Team Sonic and Rose. Team Dark's version of this stage though is a little bit longer than the others. Once we've scaled the inside of the building, there are a number of platforms filled with enemies and other obstacles like the cruisers that we need to avoid. We aren't forced into any mandatory combat encounters or anything of the sort, so you can just manoeuvre around them freely, taking advantage of the flight rings to reach the final straightaway, making it possible to clear this stage with Team Dark as well. Right from the start, Power Plant already comes with a weird inconsistency between the teams. You see, you start this stage from the air, falling to the platform below. With every other team though, it's fine. You can learn that we can just continue on from there. However, with Team Dark, for some bizarre our reason they thought it was a good idea to place a ring trail beneath them. Why is this even here? The good news is that you can avoid them, it's just awkward to pull this off consistently. To do so, you just gotta hold the analog stick at an angle before the stage even begins and eventually you'll slide right by them even if it does take a few tries to get right. Overall though, Power Plant takes everything I actually enjoyed about Grand Metropolis and made it 10 times worse. The stage is longer, it has more obstacles to avoid and the final section just makes it brutal whilst avoiding the rings. Now this stage in general can be rather combat heavy as we're forced to take out the mech so we can unlock the way forward. Nothing too intensive, especially as rings are only placed along the linear pathways, but we did mess up here because of the fact Tails' thunder shoot locked onto a rogue ring. I'd recommend that you'd only use the thunder shoot to bring down the flying enemies, and then finish them off with your power character for security's sake. So far, Power Plant wasn't really causing us any problems, as we used Tails' flight to pop the flight balloons with restoring his flight gauge in the process. This allowed us to bypass a ton of the stage from above, doing our best to avoid 
the fire balls along the energy road to reach the next section. If you aren't careful here, there is a ring balloon placed right above you, as the energy current takes us up to the higher pathway, and of course we run right into it as we weren't able to see the damn thing off screen. Hang to the left as the current takes you up and you'll have just enough room to wiggle past it, dispatching the enemies and riding the pole to the next section. This platform heavy hallway serves as the ending portion of Team Rose's version of the stage, and it's actually way harder to clear this than with any of the other teams. It all stems from the fact that rings are everywhere. If you take the upper path with the flight ring, you can't even use the others as ring balloons are placed within them. The speed path is filled with both mechs and ring containers that we need to hold an attack chain across, so no matter which way you go, you can't escape this hell. In the end, if you just commit to moving forward after entering the first flight ring, Cream will slowly descend giving you just enough time to reach the next platform with how floaty your flight is. All we have to do from here is jump from rail to rail, whilst avoiding the ring trails to beat their version of the stage ringless. For the other two teams, however, there is still far more of this stage to go. As we clear the hallway from above, we're forced onto these elevators that will take us up to the next section. The problem is that every level they will stop and we'll have to clear the enemies out to continue. This is annoying when rings are scattered all over the place, making them extremely easy to collect by accident. The best way i found to deal with this is through the Team Blast mechanic. On the upper right of the screen, there's a blue gauge that will fill up the more you actually do stuff. Collecting rings, defeating enemies and simply just attacking mid-air will all fill the gauge. And once it's completely filled, you can then use the Team Blast, that serves as a screen nuke with a number of lingering properties that differentiate between each of the teams. So if we spam the Thunder Shoot against the wall before we hop onto the rising platform, we can fill up the gauge allowing us to destroy the enemies here without physically engaging them. Since there are several waves to contend with, you will have to fill up the gauge multiple times, but this section is entirely possible to clear ringless. From this point on, Power Plant is pretty much guilty of reusing level design, as all we have to do is fight through multiple waves of Eggman's mechs unlocking the pass as we go. From here though to reach the very end of the stage, we are forced to traverse across collapsing footholds, all so whilst being chased by the rising lava. Now believe it or not, but despite being the team for advanced players, this segment of the stage is far easier with Team Dark compared to Team Sonic. It all stems from this one ring container placed underneath a pulley in Sonic's version of this set piece. Naturally, if we jump onto the pulley, Tails or Knuckles will end up breaking the ring container forcing the restart, and due to the sheer height, we can't just fly up to the next section either. This is missing in Team Dark's version, so they're able to just continue climbing until they reach the very top. With Sonic though, we were forced to damage boost our way up there instead. If we sacrifice our shield, the lava actually lifts the characters into the air when they take damage, and this allowed us to grab a hold of the pulley from above. By the time Tails and Knuckles clinged on, we were far clear from the ring container, allowing us to complete power plant with all three teams. In a similar vein to the adventure games, rival fights make a surprising return, as the teams encounter one another and in a cliche fashion fight to the death. If I had to compare these ones to the previous two games, they are more ambitious in theory yet far jankier in their execution. For convenience sake, I'm going to refer to this battle as Rival 1 and it's pretty simple. Each team is made up of three members, so it's just a rock paper scissors encounter with each formation having a weakness and strength to exploit. Except none of that really matters when all you really need to do is spawn the respective tornado attacks until you're not your opponents from the arena clearing the battle. Now this is where it gets interesting, this battle is unfortunately impossible to clear with both Team Sonic and Dark, as they're forced to collect a mandatory ring before the battle even begins. Team Rose for whatever reason don't spawn directly on top of the ring, so as long as we stand on the steel crate and just spam Amy's tornado attack, Rival 1 is actually possible to beat ringless with Team Rose. Do you see what I mean now with the weird inconsistencies? Unfortunately, it's the next two stages where we hit a brick wall. Casino Park and Bingo Highway are your classic casino levels that you'd come to expect from a Sonic game. From my testing with all three stories, it's pretty much impossible to even get that far in this stage ringless. It's all thanks to the pinball tables within the stage. Usually you'd be placed at the bottom as we traverse across the table using the various bumpers to reach the top and the next section. The pinball physics in this game suck ass, plain and simple. It's like they are both automated whilst they expect you to have full control at the same time. You pretty much have to get lucky with where the characters go and it's not uncommon to be stuck in these sections for a good 15 minutes. This is far from the worst of it though, as pretty much everything you do on the pinball tables will give you rings. Destroy the coloured neon barriers, the game gives you rings for that. Enter the jackpot machines, here's some more rings. It doesn't help that you can only control the lead of the character and not the other two, so it's almost guaranteed that the AI will do something earning you some rings for the trouble. Now you can circumvent the AI in a sense. If they fall off the pinball table and into the bottomless pit, they'll be greyed out on the hood, and you won't be able to switch to them until you find your way out of this hellhole. So in theory, if you're able to knock both of your team members off, it might be possible to clear a small portion of either of these stages, but this is far from consistent nor reasonable to even try. There might be a speedrun tech or a trick I'm missing here that 
can possibly make the next two stages more bearable. So I'm not going to sit here and claim with 100% certainty that Casino Park and Bingo Highway are impossible. It's just that I couldn't find a way that was feasible in either stage with any of the three teams. The shenanigans only continue with the first enemy gauntlet of the run, Robot Carnival. The name is basically what it suggests. This isn't as much of a boss fight as it is a battle of fruition. Eggman will continue to throw waves and mix our way and the battle doesn't end until we destroy each of them. This isn't possible to beat ringless with any of the teams as you're forced to collect a mandatory ring at the start of the battle. It is possible to clear this boss with only a ring though, as long as you use the flight formation to repeatedly jump into most of the enemies. Continuing on, Rail Canyon is a really interesting stage not only in terms of the aesthetic but the whole concept in general is really cool as well. Set at an industrial base made of nothing but rails, we are tasked from grinding from rail to rail in order to avoid the other cargo trains and in this case the rings littered throughout the path. A ton of people dislike this stage for its simplicity and whilst I can see why as it does overstay its welcome quite a bit, I do find it to be a welcome change from the standard hallway layout. Unlike Sonic Frontiers the rails aren't automated, so you do have a degree of control over your momentum which can either speed this up or slow you down to a snail's pace. Using the flight formation, we're easily capable of skipping by the many ring trails reaching the first checkpoint. You may notice that the rails going forward appear slightly different to the metal rods we had to grind along earlier, this time sporting a translucent blue colour scheme. If you grind along these as is, it's pretty much a dead end, at least until you activate a switch that will turn the rails red, allowing you to reach another part of the stage. Now the light puzzle elements don't really go beyond figuring out which switch to activate to reveal the path, but I do at least appreciate the effort to try and make this stage more varied. Upon reaching the checkpoint, you need to deal with the egg pawns whilst avoiding the rings so we can use the blue tornado to reach the higher segment. Now the easiest way to do this is to just bait them towards you before finishing them off with a few jumps, but it can be a bit tedious when they actively move away from you forcing you to repeat the entire process. As we return back onto the grind rails, these scary looking trains would run towards the screen forcing you to switch rails in order to avoid them. However, since we were moving so slow, by the time we even got close, the train had already stopped, making it a breeze to bypass. Jumping over the ring containers was also rather easy thanks to the flight characters, as we reached the end of Team Rosie's version of Rail Canyon without any rings. Using the pole to reach the higher section, we were able to avoid the ring trail thanks to the platform that you can land upon with the flight formation. Heroes has a habit of shoehorning multiple pathways in an extremely linear area, they kind of give you the illusion of choice even though they don't really branch off from each other. I can't really complain though as it allows us to continue on. Now we had a somewhat hilarious encounter towards the end of the stage. Ahead is a fan where we need to use the triangle dive and for some reason I thought this fan wasn't actually spinning when it was. Engaging the enemies to clear the way, Sonic used his blue tornado and clipped into the rail itself. Self, sending him flying into the bottom's pit. That's when I realised that we didn't even need to bother fighting the enemies in the first place, as long as we use the triangle dive around the edges to avoid the ring container placed in the centre. We do have to clear out the enemies to activate the fan in the Team Dark version of the stage though, which is rather simple in all honesty given the lack of the ring container in the other version. From this point on, the rest of Rail Canyon devolves into mindless rail grinding. Whilst the rails do derail from time to time, and we have those blue rails that we need to change the direction of with the switches, nothing here really requires anything too difficult from the player, and given how versatile the flight characters truly are, we can even skip the final section by jumping from a higher point, and landing on the orange roofing of the station that actually has collision, completing Rail Canyon ringless with all three teams. Now to give some credit, Bullet Station is far more engaging compared to the first act. Don't get me wrong, we're still grinding along the rails. However, there is a lot more of the traditional design elements that you'd expect, as we traverse the station itself rather than just the outskirts. Now my footage for Team Sonic's run of this stage corrupts itself for some reason, but I can tell you nothing of note really happened in the first minute of the stage anyway. With the Thundershoot, we were able to halt the enemy trains, in order to take the grind rails to the vault poles, crossing over the bottomless pits with the blue tornado, and activating the three switches to clear the way forward. As we got closer to the station itself, we were forced into a very tricky situation, involving a narrow walkway with a trail of rings. Tails can fly over if you're careful, but the bottom's pit really made it more tense than it needed to be. The stage however reaches an abrupt halt once we've opened the door via the switches. You see the whole set piece of bullet station involves these cannons that will shoot you from station to station as you destroy them. That really doesn't matter too much, except when you realise you have to dodge a barrage of ring balloons and spike balls to reach the next area. And throughout my testing, it's sadly impossible to avoid all the ring balloons no matter which team you're playing as. Now you can actually slip by them during the second version of the set piece, but I just couldn't find a way to do so during the first. 
so sadly this stage isn't possible to beat ringless. With Team Sonic I ended up hitting around 40 rings in total because of this, but only around 30 of those were actually mandatory, as I kinda messed up with a number of the avoidable balloons. This didn't fare much better for either of the other teams either for a very similar reason. Whilst Team Dark's version of this set piece has a lot more hazards to avoid, Team Rose's variation only has around 4 ring balloons making it appear feasible, until the last two placed right next to each other making them impossible to avoid, as we can only move the characters to either the left or right during these segments. Now it does suck to see the stage end like this, but there's nothing we can really do about it. To be perfectly honest, the Egg Albatross encounter is merely a powered up version of the Egg Heart more than anything. Both in 3 sections, we need to destroy each of them starting from the bottom before we can take on the Egg Heart directly. The bottom carriage can be a pain in the arse due to its bizarre hitbox. However, from that point, all we need to do is spam the Homing Attack until both the Blimp and the Egg Heart are destroyed. All in all, the boss fight is rather self explanatory. It's just a shame, thanks to the mandatory ring, it isn't possible to complete ringless. Now Frog Forest holds no punches when it pertains to its beginner's traps, as we start on a grind rail with a weird camera angle, and sure enough a ring trail is placed just ahead of us, with no way to see it coming unless you already knew it was there beforehand. So from the start we were forced into the flight formation and had to fling ourselves off the rails to avoid the rings, gradually floating down to the fines below to safety. A quick side note, I really do miss when they actually try to incorporate the mechanics within the aesthetic itself. Throughout the stage we'll be grinding along vines, swinging from tree to tree, and using the mushrooms as bounce pads. Mechanically they all function the same way as they usually would, but it just adds a layer of authenticity to the world and the aesthetic that they don't really bother with in the modern games nowadays. The loops here whilst automated don't have ring trails along them thankfully, giving us a pretty easy time as we reach a giant frog here that can make it rain for some reason. Now these frogs come in two variants which we'll see soon enough, however the rain spawned by the green frogs actually flourishes the forest around you, birthing fruit that you can use as springs and even the fires themselves, so the stage is constantly growing before you as you traverse through the greenery. Because of the rings along the vines, we were encouraged to risk a number of skips that really reminded me of our time in Final Rush. Frog Forest is open enough to give you the freedom of experimentation, especially with the versatility of the flight formation. The next checkpoint is just in reach, and as long as we carefully fly above the balanced pits, we aren't really impeded by anything as we reach the next loop fighting against the automation to thread through it. Now once we've reached the flower propeller, the inconsistencies between the stories appear again in a really weird manner. By using the blue tornado, the wind will send the flower herb on, and by jumping into it we can use it to cross the fast bottomless pit. Now when riding on said flower you can manipulate it slightly in all directions, this unfortunately doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of things, as it's impossible for Team Sonic to clear this section ringless due to the unavoidable ring balloon. However, for Team Dark and Rose, the ring balloon is placed in a slightly different position, and because of this, it's actually possible to avoid it, even though it's slightly awkward to do so. This is something you will never notice when playing through the game casually, and it's just bewildering to me that they bother to slightly move the ring balloon's placement specifically for the other two stories. Don't get it twisted, I'm not complaining or anything, but it just leaves me scratching my head as to why they even bother to do so in the first place. And yes, if you're wondering, I did try and avoid the flower propeller completely, as the vine rail does look close enough for Tails to reach with the flight formation, and even though I did get very close on a number of occasions, I just couldn't get close enough to actually land on it. But if you're somehow able to, you can skip the five rings from the balloon, but without a speedrunning trick or something of the sort, it doesn't appear possible. I wouldn't rule it out though. Now there are two paths that we can take from here. By holding onto the propeller, it will take us into the inside of the tree, where we'd be forced to avoid more ring balloons and use the vines to swing to the next pathway. Instead, I decided to jump off, carefully landing onto the rail, and we were rewarded with a few extra lives for our trouble. After a brief platforming section leading up to yet another propeller set piece, we've reached the end of this relatively short stage. This time around the ring balloons are completely avoidable as long as you react fast enough, and once we hop into the final find we've completed Frog Forest. Sadly, it's not possible to clear this stage ringless with Team Sonic, however Team Dark and Rose are capable of doing so, so 2 out of 3 isn't bad by any means. As we enter the thick of the jungle, we encounter for the first time one of the most annoying enemies in Sonic history, the Egg Hammers. These gigantic mechs sporting a hammer are the sole reason why people dislike the combat in Heroes. For one, they are very large. Not only do these behemoths hit very hard, they also have over 20 hit points of health. So unless you use the power characters, you really are getting anywhere in the situations where they're mandatory in order to unlock the path to progress. Fortunately for Team Sonic, this thing is avoidable, although you do have to destroy it with Team Dark as we progress through the stage, avoiding the second egg hammer from above thanks to the vines. As I previously mentioned, the frogs slated throughout the stage come in two variants, and it's here where we encounter the black frogs. In essence, they are basically the polar opposite to their natural counterparts. Whilst the regular frogs will cast rain to nurture the forest and build a path to the other sections, this thing will degrade the forest with its acid water, forcing fruit off their stems that can actually damage you now and even rot away platforms that you would otherwise need to progress. 
It's in your best interest to avoid these things at all costs. As we fly through a brief platforming section to reach the first checkpoint, the ring trails up ahead are placed within the centre of the linear paths. So as long as we just stick to the sides, they didn't really pose any troubles as we skip over yet another egg hammer thanks to the vines. Because of the acid rain, we almost took a hit from one of the collapsing fruits, but we just managed to get out of the way of it by the skin of our teeth. There are more of the fruits this time around so we can just home an attack chain off of them to scale the stage. Instead though, we just remain in the flight formation, which just gives us a little more control in the air. Upon reaching the next checkpoint, we're met with a very tricky situation for all three teams. The path ahead is just beyond this bottomless pit that's too fast for the flight characters to simply shoot. Instead, we need to use the three vines and swing ourselves across, which would be fine if it wasn't for the ring balloon placing the path of the final swing. Because of the automation whenever you jump at the height of the swing, we have to find a way to jump off the vinyl vine early enough whilst also covering enough distance to land on the platform underneath the balloon with our flight. Just be careful as whilst the mountain underneath the platform looks like you can land upon it, the collision will simply keep you suspended in the air, rather than allowing you to jump again. Now this took me a farewell with all three teams, however we were able to slip underneath the balloon as we avoided the egg at all costs, eventually leading us to yet another flower propeller. Thankfully, we only had to cross a relatively small gap with the flower this time around, so upon switching to the flight formation in order to avoid the rings, we destroy the final mech to unlock the spring, taking us to the next checkpoint. No matter which story you're tackling, you will inevitably reach a dead end being forced to take out a number of mechs to unlock the next spring. For Team Rose, it's simply one egg hammer, whilst Team Sonic and Dark have to take out multiple. Despite this though, the method remains the same, barraging with your power characters or Team Blast until they eventually crumble, and with that, we reach the goal of Team Rose's Lost Jungle without collecting any rings. For the other two, however, we must continue on, reaching another flower propeller after a brief platforming section, where we pretty much did our best to avoid the frogs and egg hammers. The propeller this time around does require more from you in terms of avoiding multiple ring balloons. This is completely possible with both teams, although with Team Dark, I did jump off a little too early, so I could use the vine to reach the final platforming section of the stage. Going forward, we need to take advantage of the green frogs, so they can create a path upwards that will take us to the final set piece of the stage. Now there are a few enemies here that we need to destroy to unlock the various cages, in order to avoid the final ring trail along the vines. With Team Sonic this didn't take very long at all, however I did take several L's as Team Dark, because of this one egg hammer placed along an extremely narrow platform. Several times we just so happened to land where it would spawn, crushing the team as a result. And unlike Knuckles, who has a versatile moveset in terms of his combat abilities, Omega is severely lacking in this regard. If you mash the attack button whilst letting go of the analog stick, instead of sliding forward with his punches, Knuckles will barrage the vicinity with rabbit punches. Not only does this melt the health bars of pretty much anything it comes in contact with, it also allows us to take out enemies without the risk of falling off the stage itself. Omega on the other hand doesn't have the ability to do this unfortunately, regardless of whether you're holding the stick or not, he will slide endlessly with every punch, and since his slide goes even further than Knuckles is, you begin to see why it's absurd to put an enemy only power characters can realistically deal with along such a narrow foothold. You pretty much just have to get lucky, and hope you can kill the fiend before Omega inevitably slides right off the platform. Once the egg hammer is dealt with though, we've reached the final part and probably the most infamous set piece in this entire game, the alligator chase. What can I say that already hasn't been said about this thing? Now the gold ring is beyond the corridor finds that we need to use to swing across the fast pit below, all the while being chased by an alligator, hungry for hedgehog steak. Now there aren't any rings here at all, we just have to survive, which is an ordeal in of itself. As I already mentioned, the swinging mechanics in Heroes are rather janky to say the least, as you need to jump the moment you reach the height of the swing to push you forward. Jump at any other time however, and your ass is either falling into the water below, or the game for some reason will send you backwards, leaving you at the mercy of Jaws over there. Which is something that happened during my run with Team Dark, although I was quickly able to react and grab hold of one of the vines. Aside from just getting lucky, you really need to stay focused on the timing of the swings, so you aren't sent backwards by the jank, but with that, Lost Jungle is possible to beat without collecting any rings. Despite the brand new arena, the second rival encounter in this game is basically a carbon copy of the first, and so we pretty much handle it in the exact same manner as well. Blue Tornado Spam for the win. I wish you luck in trying to end this fight quickly though, as for whatever reason, this specific encounter always takes me around 3 fucking minutes no matter which story I'm playing. Whilst the Tornado Spam works, sometimes the wind will barely push the AI away, and so they just keep coming back again and again. I eventually managed to get them out, but it really does wait on your patience after a bit. Similarly to Rival Fight 1, whilst it's impossible 
trouble for both Team Sonic and Rose to complete this ring list as they spawn on top of a ring making it mandatory. Team Dark does not. You can still hear the ring sound effects as we spawn into the battle though which scared me but that was caused by Team Sonic spawning into the arena. Since Team Dark and Chaotix start on the opposite side but there aren't any rings below them, Rival Fight 2 is possible with both of these teams so that's pretty cool. While I really like the original themes of the next two stages, Seriously, I can't think of a stage set within a haunted castle or mansion that predates Heroes for the life of me. The closest I can think of is that one section with the ghost in Sandopolis. Sadly, that's all the good I can say about Han Castle, as we start at the peak of this automated corkscrew, and what just happens to be placed at the bottom? You guessed it, a mandatory trail of five rings, making it impossible to clear this stage ringless with either Team Sonic or Dark. Since the spawn point for Team Rose is around the midpoint of the stage, this doesn't really apply to them, and so for the rest of this stage, I'll be focusing on their version specifically. We start off having to avoid a triple ring trail by flying over to the side. The loop here does have a ground rail that we can use to hop over it, although we just continue with what we've already been doing by threading the needle, leading us to a locked door. To unlock the way forward, we need to destroy the wooden crates to our right, revealing the shaft in the floor. That takes us to the ominous spear-like switch which will trigger the gimmick of the stage. Every time one of these things are activated, the castle will flip upside down, and we need to take advantage of this to reveal hidden switches, and to complete a variety of puzzles to unlock other pathways. It is an interesting concept, but but since the camera also flits with you, nothing ever feels difficult or challenging if that makes any sense. The switch will unlock the door is placed upon the floating platform that we can reach with cream, falling down the shaft once again to reflip the stage, taking care to avoid the ring loop in the process. Usually in the other stories once we've entered this room, we will need to destroy the waves of enemies to raise a pole to reach the next part of the stage. With Team Rose though we can avoid them completely, smacking the disc spring that will propel us upward to the higher platform. There is a small skip that we can perform here by jumping off the right side, the platform that the ground ray will lead us to is pretty much right underneath us, bypassing it completely as we hit the checkpoint. Whenever you have to cross a narrow hallway with a ring trail, keep in mind that you should always use the power formation over the flight formation. The flight formation has a very janky hitbox, so if you try to hug the side of the wall, you'll instead be pushed back into the centre hitting the ring as a result. The sheer jank of this game continued to rear its ugly head, as the launch pad didn't hit us into the switch like it should have done, so we were just stuck to the side of it bouncing endlessly until we eventually fell into the bottomless pit. As we approach the final portion of the stage, we can skip a good portion of the platforming by jumping off the rail from above and flying over to one of the other platforms. Rather than taking out the enemies here, we simply avoid them as we complete a hand castle ringless with Team Rose. As we reach the heart of the mansion, Mystic Mansion really isn't too long of a stage if I'm honest. This time around we can actually fire out of the automation that is pushing us into a ring trail at the start with a home attack spam. Remaining in flight formation after taking out the enemies to traverse the narrow hallways, we reach an open room with another one of the ominous switches. Rather than flipping the entire stage itself, this time they manipulate the things around you, whether that's changing the path of the rails or summoning mechs that weren't previously there. In this case it's the latter forcing us to take out the wave of egg pawns so we can unlock the next door, reaching the check point upon avoiding multiple crushes with the flight formation. From here we are forced into yet another combat encounter upon hitting the switch, as the laser gate won't deactivate until all the mechs are defeated. Now it's here where we sadly hit a brick wall so to speak. You see we have to use the makeshift minecarts to reach the next part of the stage, avoiding both the laser gates and ghosts that really aren't too difficult to avoid with a jump. It's as we approach a ring trail down the slope where this level pretty much becomes impossible to beat ringless. Now in theory you can spam the jump, and if you time it right you could jump in between the rings, which I actually managed to do once during my Team Dark run. It's just that there are two inclines like this before we can get off the thing, and since it appears to be a frame perfect trick, it's not entirely practical to perform, even if in theory it might be possible to avoid the two ring trails. Even then though it wouldn't have mattered as there is a mandatory light speed dash upon entering the weird dimensional hall that will take us to the next pathway. I thought maybe it was close enough to fly through, but the trail is just too far for the limited flight of the formation to cheese. I've never actually mentioned this before, mainly as it hasn't come up until now, however Sonic does have a new ability in Heroes and known as the triangle jump. To put it simply, it's basically a wall jump that we can use to cross large distances as long as there is an adjacent wall to jump onto. All the speed characters by Amy are capable of doing this. I guess Amy isn't good enough? And for Team Sonic and Dark, we need to perform the move to reach the rails that are just too far to fly towards. This can be nerve wracking as you pretty much have to land on the rail above the bottom's pit, but as long as you press the B button whenever you're above the rail itself, this will cancel the triangle jump allowing us to fall harmlessly upon it. The end of Mystic Mansion revolves around a number of bite sized challenges suited to each formation. These vary quite drastically across the teams, however, they mostly entail a combat challenge on a small platform. Once all three challenges are completed, we can activate the switch that will take us to the goal ring. None of them are really worth mentioning except the speed trial for Team Sonic. It seems simple by nature, just a home in the chat chain 
in over the ghost so we can take out the mechs on the other side. It's just that the homing attack in Heroes has its problems because of the actions of the AI. Whenever Sonic homing attacks, Tails and Knuckles will follow suit, usually targeting the enemy Sonic is attacking to deal a little bit of damage. Sometimes though, the AI can lock onto enemies ahead of you, and that's a big problem here as the ghost will disappear once they've been hit, meaning Tails or Knuckles have the potential to home and attack a ghost ahead of you, making it impossible to reach the other side. Fortunately, that didn't occur here, but it's something that always tenses me up whenever I reach this section. With that though, we've cleared Mystic Mansion, it's just unfortunate that it's impossible to beat Ringless. The bossing currency for this zone is yet another wave gauntlet similar to Robot Carnival, only it's far longer forcing you to contend with some of the most annoying enemies in the game, as we are shot from cannon to cannon in between each of the waves. Because we spawn right on top of a ring, it's impossible to beat this gauntlet ringless with any of the teams sadly, although you can beat it with a minimum of a single ring, if you use the flight formation and painstakingly jump into the enemies, or spawn the team blast when it comes to the big boys. As we approach the final zone of the game, Eggfleet stands out when it comes to the concept of the stage itself. The entire stage takes place solely in the air, as the team traverse through Eggman's flying fleet, taking out each of the battleships in the process. Despite all of that, this stage is sadly impossible to beat Ringless, and for a reason that you'd probably expect by now, a ring trail at the start of the stage placed at the end of a damn automated section. No matter what, you'll be collecting a total of 4 rings, regardless of the team. And you know what, at this point, I'm completely over it. You can try to use the light speed dash to fight against the automation somewhat, but this didn't really get us anywhere either. Whilst it might be tempting to land along one of the floating platforms, always aim for the rails as you're guaranteed to pick up a ring because of how the AI is programmed. Switching to the flight formation becomes make great use of its superior air mobility to land upon the first of the many battle fleets. To unlock the door we need to take out a bunch of egg pawns, also while being barraged by the cannons. In Team Dark's version we're pitted against the E2000 series, a red mech that is capable of powering your attacks with its shield, also whilst attacking you with its red laser. I did end up dying here in Team Dark's case because of the cannon fodder, however your power character is paramount in getting you out of this as quickly as possible, and the cannons are destructible making this slightly easier. After a brief platforming section we're once again locked into another room, this time with the E2000 mechs. They won't attack you right away, often to stand a lifelessly for a few seconds before charging their laser attack. They are only vulnerable during this state, so you should switch to your power character to melt their health bar. Paralyzing them with the thunder shoot is also an option, and I didn't actually know they were affected by that until this playthrough. This unlocks the way forward as we reach the propeller introduced in Frog Forest. Now whilst there are a ton of ring balloons for us to avoid here, you can predict where they'll be as the whole point of this section is to avoid the cannon fire, and since the characters in this game don't shut up, all you have to do is the opposite of what they tell you. You'd figure that this would actually cause you to take damage from the cannons themselves, but no actually. Even though they clearly want you to avoid the cannon fire, even if you intentionally enter their path to avoid the ring balloons, they can't actually hit you anywhere. No matter what you do here, you're in no real danger, which is pretty crazy in all honesty. As we land back onto the battle fleet, we switch to the flight formation in order to avoid the rings, flying up the brief platforming section to reach another locked door, guarded by yet another E2000 mech. From this point, the next two stages have a real habit of reusing previous parts of the stage to pad out the runtime. But upon clearing the way, we're met with a treadmill that you're supposed to use a rocket excel, this game's replacement for the spin dash to destroy the fleet. For Team Rose, the goal ring is placed just before the treadmill ending their stage with a total of 4 rings. The rocket excel though is really janky, as you will only be propelled forward by a significant degree if your power character pushes you, which rarely ends up happening. Instead, just run, and eventually Sonic will gain enough momentum to push through the treadmill regardless, leading us to another rail. From here on, we have two choices. We can either dash through the rainbow rings to remain on the upper path, or ride the fans along the bottom with the triangle dive. Team Dark does have a third route for the flight characters, but it wasn't there for Team Sonic for some reason. We did end up dying after this as an E2000 mate landed right on top of Tails as we were waiting for it to spawn. Upon its defeat though, it allows us to reach the checkpoint as we use the triangle dive to ride the wind of the fans. Rinse and repeat this entire section all over again, and we've completed Eggfleet with a total of 4 rings. When I was looking back at the footage while writing this script, I noticed that the second section of this stage is exactly the same as the first, just slightly harder. This does make sense given the development history of Sonic Heroes, but it's something I've never really noticed until now. The final stage of the run Final Fortress is best summed up as a gauntlet for a massive thunderstorm set at the heart of Eggman's battleship. From some of the most deadly enemies in the game, tight platforming sections over currently spawnless pits, and death defying set pieces that made the most hardened of veterans blush, I really wasn't feeling confident coming into this one. Even on a casual playthrough, it's not uncommon for this stage to last a good 10 minutes. Chart that up with how carefully we usually have to play during these challenges, and yeah, this is going to take a while. 
As we land on the starting rail, there are rings here along the slope. They are just bloody hard to see because they blend in with the rail itself. With the flight formation though, we do have enough mobility to leap over them as long as you jump at the height of the slope. In fact, the flight formation is monumental in remaining on the upper path in spite of the collapsing platforms. As we reach the first checkpoint upon passing through the flight ring, collecting a shield for our trouble. Now the easiest way to approach this next section is through the triangle jump. In Team Dark's version of the stage, you do have to be careful because of a ring balloon placed on the other side. But you can avoid this by simply scaling down the wall a bit before wall jumping. Upon switching back to the flight formation, we enter the first of many mandatory combat encounters. Placed on a narrow platform filled to the brim with rings, we're forced to contend with an armoured egg hammer. This version of the mech is far more tedious than the previous. For one, we simply can't damage it by attacking him with the power characters. First, we have to remove the helmet from its head by thunder shooting whilst it's off balance to reveal its weak spot. The weak spot is the only real way to damage this thing outside of the team blast, and that spells a problem when it's rather difficult to hit the head in the first place. So rather than risking a restart by engaging the thing, we simply just spam the thunder shoot to fill up the team blast, nuking it with a special attack. This unlocks a switch that we need to activate in order to ride the portal to the rails above, taking care to remain on the top path to avoid any unnecessary combat encounters. Speaking of unnecessary encounters, upon avoiding another triple ring trail, the door leading to the next checkpoint and the self-destruct sequence is blocked off by a powered-up E2000 mech, sporting a gold colour scheme. Unlike the armoured egg hammers, this thing is virtually identical to its weaker counterpart, making it pretty easy to take down as we reach the checkpoint destroying the first of the flagships in the fortress. As you land back onto the rail, you're going to want to switch as soon as possible. They place the trail of rings quite high up this time around, so unless you knew they were already there beforehand, you're just going to end up running right into them. And believe me, this this happened so many times, simply because I couldn't even see them due to the camera. Towards the end of this section there are the cannons that will shoot lasers at us along the rails. The telegraph is quite easy to read, as the affected rails will conduct electricity, giving you time to move on to one of the adjacent rails. However, there's also another very easy way to deal with this, that I never see anybody even try. Whilst quite sizeable, the hitbox of the lasers can't reach that high in the slightest, so we can just fly into the air with our flight character and as long as we don't move, the gauge won't decrease, allowing us to simply wait in the air until the laser attack finally cools down. Now it is a slower method for sure, but it beats somehow falling off a rail while she would tend to switch at high speeds. In the case of Team Rose, the lasers are actually absent, instead replaced by the numerous spinning strike balls that we need to evade along the rails themselves. Upon evading them though, we've completed their version of the stage without collecting any rings. Before we can take on the next set of rails to reach the final portion of the stage, we're forced into yet another mandatory encounter with the E2000s. There's only one, so it shouldn't prove too difficult until you realise you also have to contend with the six cannons shooting at you as well. The easiest way to deal with this is to charge your team blast before you grind down to the pathway, nuking everything in pretty much a single blow as we activate the fan right in the wind to the higher path. Depending on the team, your goal here differs quite a bit. With Team Dart, we need to activate three switches along the floating platform so we can use the tornado to swing along the pole. In the case of Team Sonic though, we have to destroy two egg hammers and this will grant us access to the switch. This was easily doable with the Team Blast, allowing us to take the rail to the final combat encounter of this increasingly tedious affair. Now I thought we were being slick when we used the flight formation to pretty much skip the encounter on the ground floor, until I realised that the E2000 series can actually fly up here, almost shelling us from behind as we continued with the numerous egg hammers. The team blast got rid of them all fairly quickly, even if it was a little too close for comfort. Unfortunately, our ringless run for Team Dark ends here. To activate the pole, we need to funnel shoot a target, and usually when this occurs, you'll either get a free team blast or a set amount of rings. And in this case, it's a total of five rings. It really sucks due to how close we are to the end, but we still have a chance as Team Sonic, as they do get the free team blast in their version of this section, which really does come in handy, with the final checkpoint being blocked off by three more egg hammers. Keeping our laser evading trick in mind, all we have to do is remain in the air until the 16 lasers vanish. Even the shot from the egg cannon can't reach Team Sonic in the air either, making it surprisingly easy to cheese. And if you didn't already know this, you're actually supposed to hold the B button down whilst grinding guys, not mash it. As long as you're holding the button down whilst you go down the slope, you'll gain a shit ton of momentum and speed. All mashing actually does is reset your momentum. However with that, we complete the final action stage of the run ringless with both Team Sonic and Rose. The conclusion of this run starts with the Egg Emperor, and to put it simply, Simply, this boss fight can be brutal even in a casual run. The area is filled to the brim with hazards from the cannons, and a number of flying mechs running amok along the pathway. The boss itself is no slouch either. Its main form of attacking you is via the crescent energy waves it will slash towards you with its lance, coming in both a horizontal and vertical variant. This will continue until we reach the dash pad that takes us to a larger arena, and this is where the battle truly begins. Given the fast amount of hazards on display, you may think just hanging back might be the careful way to handle this, and to give credit to Azuka, he he already thought of that. If you get too far away from the Egg Emperor, like most other bosses in Heroes, they will then charge right towards you, and thanks to the other hazards, this will surely spell our demise. 
Even in the more open spaces, there are so many hazards thrown at you at once that it makes it extremely difficult to beat Ringless. Except if you're playing the GameCube port. Now if you know anything about Sonic Heroes, then you're probably aware of the contradicting quality between each of the console versions, and this is no exception. Whilst the GameCube port is generally considered the best way to play this game, it does have one exploit that makes this battle a hell of a lot easier Ringless, this being the Thundershoot glitch. To put it simply, if you do a Thundershoot whilst also pressing one of the face buttons to switch characters, this will cause the game to freak out adding way more to the Team Blast gauge than intended, and this can be abused to fill the Team Blast absurdly quickly. This method pretty much makes this battle an afterthought, as we can melt the Emperor's health down like it's nothing. You do have to be careful of the other hazards though, but aside from that, this battle becomes a joke. Concluding this first part with the knowledge that no, you cannot beat the first three stories of Sonic Heroes without collecting any rings, and it's not even close. And with that, we've reached the conclusion of the first part of this challenge. And whilst we absolutely failed this time around, the subtle changes made to the level design from each of the playthroughs definitely made this a more engaging, albeit confusing challenge throughout this time around. Some of the changes do make sense when it comes to the shortened level length for most of Team Rose's stages, yet you also had the ring balloon in Frog Forest being placed in a slightly different location for Team Dark, which just makes you question why they bothered to even move it in the first place. With the first three stories down, join us next time for part two of this challenge, when we take on the final story to see where it's possible to beat the game without collecting any rings as Team Chaotix. Now there is a reason why I've decided to dedicate an entire part to them specifically, which I'll explain in the next video, but I think for the time being covering these three playthroughs is more than enough. As always, I just want to take the time to thank each and every one of you for your continued support. It's thanks to you guys that this channel continues to grow and why I can even do this in the first place. So sincerely guys, thank you. With that though, I think I've taken up enough of your time. So take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye bye for now.